Warm greetings from Estonia, the Baltic nation. I'm in Tallinn for teachers conference. And this is I Faith Sermon on the Mount B, the second lesson in our series on the poor in spirit and those who mourn. The entire Sermon on the Mount series, like the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7, focuses on character. Chapter five, how we treat other people. Chapter six, the religion of our heart as we trust in God and not the world. Chapter seven is on generosity, seeking his will. And there are also some strong warnings against those who would try to move us away from God's standard, that we rather must build on the foundation of Jesus's words. The focus of this series is on the inner spiritual life, far more than it is on conformity to some code or uniformity within a church system. There are eight bad beatitudes in this section. We're going to be looking at the first two. They are blessed who realize their spiritual poverty, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. That's Matthew 5, 3. And there are various passages that may shed light on this. For example, there's a proverb that speaks of being lowly in spirit. It's better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud, Proverbs 16, 19. But there's another passage that I think lies behind many of the Beatitudes, and it's Isaiah 61, and you may recognize this. This is what Jesus read out at Nazareth when he had his first message in his hometown. And sometimes it's called the Nazareth Manifesto, but this is Luke 4. And he lays out his agenda and strongly implies he is the Messiah. Let me just read a, a bit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So you heard phrases like good news for the poor and binding up the brokenhearted. And one more passage, just a few chapters later in Isaiah 66. God says, I will look to this type of man, even to him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. It's quite clear that being poor in spirit is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It has to do with being open to God's word, being flexible, not insisting on my opinion, but being receptive to truth. Jesus came to our level. He came into our world and he gave up his heavenly privilege to become fully human, lower than the angels, and he moved downward from heaven to earth, but also from the table to his knees as he washed our feet, John 13. Sometimes we speak of a horse, a wild horse, a stallion, that's full of spirit, that needs to be broken before it is of use to its rider. And in a similar way, our spirits when they are willful and self-focused, you know, it's all about what I want to do, then they need to be broken before we can really be of any use to the master. Jesus did not refer to those who are simply poor in worldly substance, but to those who are poor in spirit, those who are not inflamed with pride, but have the gentle and lowly character of humility, not thinking more of themselves than they ought. Sounds like Philippians 2, but it's actually, uh, Few hundred, a couple hundred years later, it's an early Christian named Archelaus, and that was the understanding. So being poor in the spirit, that's the first of the Beatitudes. Again, there are dozens of Beatitudes in the New Testament, but in the Sermon on the Mount, there are eight. Let's move now to the, to the second, and that is, blessed are those who mourn, those who grieve, those who are profoundly sad. I'm reminded of a brother I spoke to recently who just lost his father, and I'm sure if you're connected with many people, you frequently hear of people going through hard times and often it's death. Though, as we know, mourning is not just about death. We mourn many things. We could mourn the loss of friendship, the loss of a job, the loss of financial security. It could be we're older and our children are leaving home and that makes us sad. Loss of a dream, truthfully, the death of a pet you love your pet, you love your dog or your cat, perhaps. Maybe not the cat, but the dog. Injury, illness, divorce, so many things. So grieving, mourning can be more than just death. Well, this beatitude, which is Matthew 5, 4 says, 
Blessed are they who grieve, for God will comfort them. Now, I used to take this passage mainly as referring to death, or later as being quite broad in application, which I think it is, but there's another way to look at it, and it has to do with sin. And there are numerous illustrations of men and women in the Bible who are mourning over their sins in genuine, godly repentance. And we'll also see this was a common understanding in the early church. Now, Luke's gospel especially illustrates this concept, uh, like in Luke 6, 25, about woe to you who laugh now, you will mourn and weep. But let me give you some real life examples. Luke 7, the widow of Nain. This widow was grieving, not just because her husband had already died, but they only had one child and her son has just died, at least until Jesus stops the funeral procession, right? And then he gives her a son back. Later in that same chapter, Luke 7, we have the woman who mourned at Jesus' feet. She wept, her tears falling down onto his feet. We have the lost son, the prodigal son in Luke 15. We have the tax collector at prayer in Luke 18, who wouldn't even look up to heaven, but truly mourn for his sins. We have Jesus weeping, not over his sin, but over the sins of Jerusalem and the certain consequences that would come, that is total destruction by the Romans. That's in Luke 19. Or we can think of Peter weeping, mourning in Luke 22 after he denied Jesus. Of course, Judas also wept, but he did not mourn. He was not blessed by God. There are other New Testament passages. If you know the New Testament well, you must be thinking of Jesus weeping at the death of Lazarus or the passage on changing our mourning or our laughing to mourning in, in, John, in uh, James chapter 4, verse 8 and 10. And there's a lot about this in 2 Corinthians. I think especially chapters 1 and 7. But let's go back to the Old Testament, to that passage that seems to inspire or animate these Beatitudes. And I'll, I'll read selectively the passage Jesus read out when he started his public ministry. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Beautiful passage. Again, that's Isaiah 61, and you might also want to look at Amos 6.6. 6. But that passage in Isaiah, it's so beautiful. It's so moving. And Jesus must have been feeling and thinking that passage when he said, blessed are those who mourn. Let me give you an example also from the early church. And this is from the early 200s. Blessed are those who weep, for they will be comforted. If anyone weeps over his own sins, if anyone's converted to repentance after committing sins and washes away his errors and tears, and the quotation continues. But the concept is mourning, not just because someone you love has died, though godly people do mourn and weep. We deal with things, Acts 6. But maybe what Jesus is referring to is more mourning, being tender-hearted enough to mourn over our own sins. Am I distressed by my sin? I know sometimes my sin distresses other people. Half the time I don't even see it. And half the time I try to change, but it's, kind of, it's somewhat half-hearted. Are we really mourning? Are we really cut and, and broken? And this is a huge theme biblically. Let's talk about application. Uh, just a, a few more thoughts before we close about mourning. It's not unspiritual to mourn, to mourn over those who die, to mourn our, over, over our own sin, although it's possible to be too hard on ourselves, to spend too much time thinking on the negative, and that's not healthy, obviously. But when I am hurting, when I'm mourning, let others comfort me. I think that's what Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 1. When others are mourning, we can offer them comfort but not to offer comfort or not to receive help. Neither of those is good. We probably need to unlearn some worldly concepts about men and women, femininity and masculinity. Weeping is okay. Mourning is okay for men. Learn to think more biblically about grief, sadness, suffering, and pain. 
is this is a massive theme in the Bible. The theme of suffering is, you will find this in virtually every book of the Bible. Did you know that? That's why I wrote a book on that topic. I mean, it's so huge. We need to talk about that more because that's part of the real world. What about poor in spirit? The, the beatitude before. I guess I have to ask this question. Am I broken or brokenhearted? Am I aware of my profound need for a savior? Or would I say, well, I needed a savior when I was 18 years old, but now I don't really need a savior. Am I high and mighty? Am I too e egotistical? Maybe I look at Jesus's lifestyle and I'm scandalized. I look at his followers and I feel a bit embarrassed. Or do I really uh, have a humility? Am I really poor in spirit? The opposite could be said to be being puffed up. So the idea I want to give you is a little Bible study you can do. That a phrase puffed up appears in the Greek New Testament four times, once in Colossians 2, but three times in 1 Corinthians. So maybe after this, look at 1 Corinthians 4, 6, then look at 1 Corinthians 8, 1, and then 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Some passage, some translations say love is not arrogant, but in the Greek, it's love is not puffed up, the same word. Am I puffed up or am I poor in spirit? <laughs> Interesting, because wind spirit, <laughs> that's the same word in Greek, right? And in Hebrew, so, and breath. So you think of the balloon being puffed up, if it's too puffed up, it's gonna pop. But we need to let some air out and, <laughs> and not be puffed up. Am I poor in spirit? And one very good, evidence of this is my my attitude before God. Do I tremble at God's word? That's a phrase we find a couple of times in Isaiah. Do I tremble? If, I, if I'm humble and contrite in spirit, then God's word will hit me hard. If you need more scripture, look at Proverbs 8, 32 to 36. Well, that's all for today. Our next message is on blessed are the meek, or you could say the humble, and blessed are those who hunger for justice. But for now, goodbye from Estonia in the Baltic part of Europe. I hope these words of our Lord Jesus have made a difference and will help you to have a better day as a result.